Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome at our next presentation. Uh, exactly eight days ago, I invited Alexander Bird to my podcast, and we were discussing almost two hours, and I was totally impressed. Alexander was one of the most interesting person I have ever met. And maybe I should start with the thing that Alexander started his career as a, as a musician. He created six bands, if I'm, it's, it, it's correct, yeah, six bands, something. <laughs> uh, the most famous band is called uh, Army of Lovers, and everybody knows hits from Army of Lovers here in uh, Slovakia or the Czech Republic because uh, the, these songs were hits in the beginning of the 90s in these post-socialist countries. And um, after this career, uh, he started to be a philosopher. And he wrote, during the period of 20, 20 years, he wrote five books. Uh, the first book, if I'm correct, was Netocracy. And Netocracy was, uh, is the book about the explosion of the, of the internet. And um, he coined some, some new terms. And one of the new terms was netocrats, which is a new internet aristocracy. The people behind internet corporations, internet giants, these people are, according to Alexander, the, the netocrats. And also he, he defined a new term, which is called, a coined new term, which is called uh, consumptariat. So these consumptoria are all people who are just consumers in this new digital aristocratic system. After this book, he uh, published some other books, but one of very interesting book, book is book about synthesis, because Alexander also created a new church or new religion in, in Sweden. It's called Synthetic, Synthetic Church. And synthetic church, basically, this religion is focused on atheist and pantheist, people who are looking for some kind of internal spirituality. I, I, found, I found out the information that the, the biggest, biggest event for uh, like this synthetic, synthetic uh, movement is Burning Man Festival, because Alexander is also very influential and very active in organizing uh, Burning Man Festival, also in organizing his local, uh, local Burning Man version, which is called Borderland, if I remember correctly. And his recent book is called Digital Libido, so Sex, Power and Violence in the Network Society. And I was especially impressed that he he decided to, to classify people to two categories. Uh, the first category are heroic people, people who are able to cope with their past, with everything they uh, would happen in, in their past, and they try to do the best according to their moral values. And then you have people of victimhood, victimhood culture, and maybe Alexander is the right person who will tell you more about, about this recent book. Okay, so welcome, Alexander, here. I'm really happy Thank to you. have you here. Can you hear me? It's on? Yeah, okay. Um, actually, I'm not, I'm not going to be very low-tech. I'm just going to use a little, uh, you know, a few sheets of paper and just draw something, because I'm actually going to try a new idea with you guys. You deserve it, right? So I'm a philosopher. A philosopher is not a scientist. A scientist is a person who tries to solve problems, and then hopefully his mother's going to like him for it, and maybe his girlfriend even, you know? That's a scientist, right? Uh, a philosopher is somebody who invents problems. So I like to make the world worse for you, 
more complicated. Um, and that's what philosophers do. And I'm going to launch a concept we're working on. We're working actually on a trilogy on Sede Christ and I, the, the synthesis and Bach, Creating God in the Internet Age. And by the way, that's a better take than Ray, Ray Kurzweil's awful singularity theory. It needed to be worked on and done properly. And then Digital Libido, which is a very dark book, because it's going to be a very dark period now, the next 50 years, often called the Dark Renaissance we're heading to now. That's a really dark book. But that's typical for a trilogy. Right first, say that there's something amazing things going to happen sometime in the future, we're heading towards that, and then you warn everybody, says, because you don't understand it, it's going to be a real fuck up first, right? So we're working on the third part of this trilogy, it's going to take us another two, three years or something before Jan and I are finished. But I'm going to work on a concept with you guys today that I think you can find interesting. And the concept is called paradigmatics. So paradigmatics, ironically, we need a new term for that. A paradigmatics is that Assume that you live in a specific historical period. So you arrive in some kind of a context. These are the conditions you live with. You're told certain rules and laws and things that you need to abide to. And very often these laws or rules that you need to abide to are old and Luddite and hate the future. And they just basically want to conserve you and not do anything smart. Okay, that's usually what happens in history. So you arrive in a paradigm and you discover that the paradigm around you actually is radically new compared to what everybody believes around you. So you want a pragmatic approach to that paradigm. You want to know how you become a winner. How do you master the new paradigm? How do you become smarter than anybody else? And this is what we call paradigmatics. And here's the problem. You guys here are one of the three notocracies that we write about in our books, I've written about for the past 20 years. You're one of the three notocracies, the one we call the protopians. Uh, you're not, of course, internet giants, tech giants, and that kind of shit. The guys who collect the data is the first netocracy. The second netocracy are the censocracies. It's going to replace politicians and things like that. Why would you vote every four years when you actually vote every second? Of course, the Chinese take on that is dictatorship and the dictator, and all the data in an entire nation goes into a central computer in control of the dictator. It's a very old Egyptian idea, actually. It's not very Chinese. Um, but, you know, we're probably fighting against that. I think we all agree on that. We support the guys in Hong Kong at the moment. Whatever they can do to fuck it up, that's fine. So you belong to another netocracy, which is the Protopians. And fortunately, your best or most popular brothers and sisters in the world today are called Taiwanese hackers. The coolest thing you can be on the planet right now is to be a Taiwanese hacker who's trying to get around the three million censors who are employed by the Chinese government to control communist China. And luckily there are 80 million Chinese people in exile and they're probably the most innovative, wealthiest people on the planet right now, and they're the ones you ally with. So, paradigmatic theory is like, what kind of paradigm do we live in? Well, the problem is that you're going to have a lot of old power structures redundant old power structures when you do a paradigm shift, which is what's currently going on. You can then either be mediocre at the paradigm, paradigmatics, which means you're just going to beat the old power system and improve on what you do compared to them. You can also go really deep into history, deep into what it means to be human in a historical sense, deep what it means to have technology around you, and you can actually use the entire system, the old paradigm, to become a master of it much better than anybody else because you're not just good enough to be mediocre. You're better than Facebook. We're all going to leave Facebook in 10 years' time. We're all going to keep Bitcoin forever, but that's just because it's God's currency. It's a currency that no human being can kill. It's just like the internet. That's why the internet is a god too, because you can't stop the internet. You can blow up the entire planet with atomic bombs. doesn't matter, the internet will still be around because it is a completely decentralized system that can very soon put its own energy into the system, and by that time, the internet lives on its own, and it's a god. Same thing with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is God's currency. You know, you don't have to be offended if I don't talk more about Bitcoin, because you do that the entire weekend anyway. I'm actually going to move you over to another part of paradigmatics. So, that is, what is this paradigm? What is it really, really, really about? Because I think the war over currency is very marginal. Why? Because money in itself, as a communication of value, was invented during the old paradigm. So if you're obsessed with money and currency, you're probably too obsessed with the old paradigm to actually get what the new paradigm is all about. And instead, what I want to talk about today is that the real war between the old power structure and the new power structure that we're going to see over the next 50 years is the war over the algorithms. Because the algorithms are genuinely historically new, and whoever controls the algorithms is going to have the ultimate power. 
The rest is just communication tools. That's what currencies are. So what does this mean? It means that we're coming out of a paradigm. We've had three major human paradigms in the past. We happen to speak. Apes don't speak. So the first paradigm is just spoken language. That paradigm lasted for at least 200,000 years. And with Homo sapiens, we spoke to each other for 200,000 years. And anything we needed, we had to memorize. Because the only storage space for information we had was our own brain. And that's probably why power in a tribe was held by an old woman, because she had memorized more stuff than you had. So if you were 20 years old, the old woman would just come up to you when you were cocky during your rite of passage and say, I'm 20 years old, and look at my big dick, and I'm going to take over the world. And an old woman would just walk up to you in the tribe and say, smack you in the face, and say, you're nothing without me. You know nothing. And that's essentially how a tribe still works. If you go to the Amazonian jungle or go to New Guinea, I do. I'm an anthropologist. So, and I still think it's a great idea, by the way, that old women smack young men in the face. They should more often, right? And they should be paid for it, and then they're called therapists. OK. So anyway, uh, the paradigmatics we're involved with here is to understand the third paradigm that comes out of that. The first one is spoken language. The second one is written language. It starts about 8,000 years ago. With written language, you can actually create permanent settlements. So one of the most radical moves in human history was that some fat old bitch sat down in Babylon 8,000 years ago and said, I'm not going to move any longer. I'm not going to be nomadic. I'm going to have a permanent settlement, and you guys need to deliver to me. The first towns in history were created. Because of what? Because we could start to store information outside of our own brains. If you write down information, it's outside of your brain. So it's a very simple logic. It just means that if you write everything down, so you get the old woman, she's about to die. You sit with her in a nursery home. She's got COVID-19. She's about to die. You ask her about her entire life. You write everything down. She dies. They'll say, oh, the old woman is dead. Our matriarch is dead. And you say, don't worry. I kept all the information. I wrote it down. So we don't have to make the mistakes she made during her life. We can build on her previous experience. This is called eventology. And it's the only new idea we human beings ever come up with besides being nomadic. Because in a nomadic society, everything was a return to the same all the time. It's called Hinduism today. Douglas Rushkoff still wants to go back to it. It's just like everything returns to the same. The only new idea anybody ever came up with was Zoroaster's idea, 3,700 years ago in Persia, that, wait a second, if we store information outside of our own brain, including writing contracts, which is wonderful, so you can legally own territory, OK? So if you store information outside your own brain, that means what we call in psychoanalysis, the son starts dreaming about creating a better world than his father could have done. That idea is impossible without written language. And it's the only new radical idea we ever did. So after spoken and written, suddenly somebody in Germany in 1450 invented the printing press, and that's mass media. So, take a book, 1449. How would you make a book in 1449? Here in Bohemia, Czech Republic. You would have to handwrite it. How long would it take to handwrite a book? Three years on average. Okay? How much would it cost? I'm a bit vulgar in not saying bitcoins. I'm saying 160,000 euros per book. So 160,000 euros per book, three years of work, not many books around. And they're probably all Bibles and Korans, and that's about it. Okay, if you had four books, you were cool. You had a VIP lounge, you got laid. You must have been incredibly wealthy to have four books. 1450, the printing press comes along. A lot of monks and nuns around Europe start protesting. They demonstrate and said, stop the printing press, it's killing our jobs. Okay, that's been all of history. Every time there's a paradigm shift, there are a lot of people invested in the previous paradigm who want to stop the new one. This, this is exactly why I was the only music company director in Europe who was also a member of the Pirate Party. They both hated me. I was in both paradigms. Okay, so I stayed with the pirates. There you go. But anyway, 1550, no more monks and nuns. They're all redundant. They're all gone all over Europe. The average cost of producing a book is 30 cents. Maybe there are slightly more books around. Make sense? OK? By the time you get to Paris 1789 and the French Revolution, which is not really a revolution, the revolution happened in 1450. The French Revolution is a symptom of a revolution. It's the result of the revolution. The paradigm shift is happening now because the technology is already there. Why Paris 1789? Because Paris in the 1780s had become the first city in the world where half the population could read and write. 
Why? Because the cost of books had fallen to nothing. You could publish a book every day full of gossip and call it a tabloid. Or you could just basically accumulate all the information of everything that ever happened in human history and call it an encyclopédie. Great innovations. France became the center of the world. Paris took over the world. 11 years of digital libido chaos, called the French Revolution. And finally, one day, a little Corsican dwarf steps onto the stage. It's the year 1800. He's made a brilliant career through the French army because they killed all the aristocrats. So the Corsican dwarf is now the general. And he walks out in the Beaumaire Square in Paris and says, listen, guys, aren't you tired of all the bloodshed and the mess because you don't get that there's a paradigm shift going on? I'll take over. I'll be the dictator. That's probably very likely what's going to happen this time around, too. But Napoleon gave us the model that we've since then stuck with. And the model looks a bit like this. You put a Corsican dwarf at the top of a structure. Underneath the Corsican dwarf, you have a bunch of officers. Underneath the officers, a bunch of sub-officers. And at the bottom of this army, or bureaucracy, you put the cannon fodder. Information travels from the top down with enormous efficiency. Why? Because it's mass media. And it's cheap. In 1806, Napoleon conquered all of Europe. With Napoleon's army, he had fewer soldiers in the enemy, but he won every battle anyway. Why? Because his soldiers could read and write. He knew that if you create a structure where even the cannon fodder at the bottom of the hierarchy could read and write, you have a whole new society. He was a paradigmatic genius. He understood how to use written language, maximally, optimally. And Hegel and Nietzsche and all the other great philosophers of the 19th century love Napoleon. They consider him like a messianic figure. And this model, after Hegel, 1807, and the philosophy of spirit, it's a widely read philosophical work, became the model for how you organized all of Europe in the 19th century. Europe had the fastest economic growth we've ever seen in the 19th century. It also had a huge population increase because people could survive in cities instead of dying all the time. You could also organize everything in that society according to this model. Every nation state, every bureaucracy, every government, every corporation, every school, every hospital, all of these institutions put a Dr. Napoleon or a Mr. Napoleon at the top, and then you report all the way down with enormous efficiency. That's Napoleon's army. That's the model Europe built, built itself on, and then the rest of the world has just replicated it. So we have the nation-state model for the rest of the world. Europe managed to even conquer three other continents and populate them in the same process. It's the most remarkable thing anybody ever did in history was the European conquest of the planet in the 19th century. That's undeniably a fact. OK. So what then happens is that in the 20th century, we get radio and television. And please look at this diagram. Radio and television only reinforce the mechanisms that already come out of the printing press. That means that up until the 1980s, any management theorist or organization theorist anywhere in Europe or anywhere in the world would teach this model as the optimal model for how you organize a bunch of people. Makes sense, huh? You can't do it any other way. Why? Because that's how it works when mass media controls the society. Were you allowed to have a radio station? No, you were not. You either had to have tons of money, or you had to have tons of political influence. You either had to have money already, or political influence to run a radio station. Same thing to run a TV station. Same thing to run a newspaper. So any of these mechanisms with which you controlled society would have to be eligible to somebody who either paid their way or were politically okayed to do it. Usually both, by the way. So money in politics was driving this paradigm. That's why I say you should watch out when you talk too much about currencies. It's actually old paradigm bullshit talk. So there you go. So it's just value communication anyway. But this is how communication operates in a Napoleonic system. Then the internet comes along. And it fucks it up completely. Why? Well, somebody came up with the idea that we should put the smartphone in the hand of 7 billion people on the planet. And how do they react? Well, they learned from the mass media society that if you get a chance to speak, you deserve to have a large audience, and everybody will love you for it, and you have the talent to do it.
So basically, you take a society which is like a social theater, and you have like tons of people who are sitting there in the audience, and you have a few stars performing on a stage. And now you declare that, oh, this is the internet, and we're going to move all of you people who are in the audience up on the stage, and you're all going to be stars. I knew this was all the wrong things, and Silicon Valley would fail when I worked for a record company and I found out there was something called MySpace in 2003. And I said, MySpace is just all the crap shit that we at record companies avoid people from hearing because they don't want to hear it. And now all that shit is out there, and it's always Americans who do this. Americans always tell you you're beautiful and you're fantastic and you're talented and you're going to win no matter what. They always bullshit you into believing that, don't they? Because they believe it themselves, no matter how mediocre they are. They don't get Nietzsche. So anyway, you got all these Americans telling you're going to be a star. Everybody's putting bullshit up on the, on the internet. And then they're pretending to like each other. Whenever you hear somebody say, thank you for the ad, that is idiotic. It's just like, if I added you, it's probably because I knew you, so I would tell a third person that you and I get along in our friends. And if I just added you to pretend that we listen to each other's bullshit, that's Facebook, right? I knew Facebook would fail the day they didn't have a button you could push and dislike things and remove people. Because that's, that's, that, then Facebook would have been grounded in reality, but it isn't. It's just a kindergarten. So all this bullshit is going on. So the internet is essentially, what happened is the cannon fodder start talking directly to each other. And that's fine. It's decentralized. We like that, right? Eight billion people are talking directly to each other, or rather they're shouting at each other with megaphones called smartphones. And this chaos grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And this dies. Napoleon's dead and over. We hate the authorities. Yeah, we're going to be all kinds of little minority groups, and we're going to be offended as long as we get attention. It's all about attention. It's my time now to speak. It's my time now to be a star. It's all very, very infantile. But that's just how the internet operates until now. OK, what is the problem with this structure? The problem with this structure is naively flat. It says that we get 7 billion people on the planet. We all give them a smartphone, which they can afford. We all say they can get a Gmail account and a Facebook account or a ProtoMail account or whatever account they want to learn how to program and code. It costs them absolutely nothing. So the internet is moving towards zero cost. It doesn't cost anything to go online. It's going to kill capitalism. Because the point with capitalism was that there were rare resources and you paid for them. That's why we have a deflation or depression in the world economy. That's why people are throwing money at each other and don't know what to do with it. They go crazy. Why is that? Because we always look for a messiah or a savior and we create a mess like the current one. The old paradigm will moralize against the new paradigm. The old paradigm will tell us that there's fake news out there, as if newspapers hadn't always written fake news. It was always North Korean. It was always about licking somebody's ass who was powerful. It was never decentralized. It was never spread among the people. People were fooled into believing that once every four years, you're going to go thankfully and put something in a voting booth, and you're going to be thankful because you can do that. The rest of the time, we're going to rule you as we please. And an academic and a politician and an industrialist, all they needed to do was to have a little dinner together and sort out things in between them, and they could run any nation state as they pleased. Okay, so they moralize against this mess for good reasons. Yeah, it's messy. It's tons of fake news. It's actually just a lot of shit. It's 99% junk, but so was the previous paradigm, except it pretended to be something else. So, okay, what solves the problem? We hate chaos. Whenever in history we human beings have confront chaos, we go for anything that remotely looks like order in the chaos. Germany was chaotic in 1933. That's why they loved Adolf Hitler. Five years later, Adolf Hitler was the most popular politician who ever existed. 95% of Germans approved of Adolf Hitler's policies in 1938. The only 5% didn't were called Jews. You know? So much for popularity, so much for people, you, if you can trust people. No, if somebody behaves like a phallic master, people go with it. They go either with the lynch mob or they go with the exodus. They either go with the exodus to the promised land or they go with the lynch mob and they can't tell the difference. If he looks like a leader, he must be a leader. If he says something pleasing to you, it's probably the tyrant. If he challenges you, it's probably a prophet. But most people couldn't care less about the difference. 
So, we need order in the chaos. Thankfully, though, we human beings have not presented the messianic savior yet, or somebody who can step in and you know, stop the lynch mobs and stop, stop the tyrants and be the messiah. No human actually is even close to that role today. But technology has presented its savior. It's called the algorithm. The algorithm means that we just accumulate all this data out here, and then we build an algorithm. Phallic structure creates order in the chaos. Now, if you build an algorithm, at least if you do a good algorithm, you take two factors into perspective. One of them is called awareness. You multiply awareness with credibility, and you create a value called the tension value. That means uh, if you're the best guy in the world at doing something but nobody knows about it because you don't even have a home page to tell anybody, you have no attention. If everybody knows who you are but they all hate you, you have no attention. It's a combination of awareness and credibility that gives you attentional value. This is the fundament of any algorithm you build. Please note, there are no money signs. If you get on the top of a search engine, at least it should be because you just happen to be the best in the world doing what you're doing, regardless of quantity. It measures nothing but quality. How does it do that? It measures who goes to a certain web page. It measures how long they stay. It measures what they do when they interact with it. It measures whether they use their services or not. It measures whether it tells their friends they like the experience or not. It certainly measures whether they return or not. All the things that we human beings value that really nothing to do with money, are actually measured in an algorithm. And they're measured every time you turn on your smartphone or your laptop. So far, so good. As often when it comes to freedom, the freest state of what you love, if you love freedom, like we do, is free in the beginning. And then it gets destroyed. And that's actually what's happening with all the algorithms right now. Why? For two reasons. The algorithm is attacked on one side by the corruption of money. On the other side, the algorithm is attacked by the manipulation from politics. So, we hear all these arguments that, oh, but the algorithms must be controlled. We can't have free and open algorithms. We can't handle that. We're just children. The old power structure speaks to us and says, the algorithm is evil if it's free and open, because it actually reflects human beings, and we can't have that. No, we must work on improving human beings. We must work on improving them in a certain direction. Oh, and that direction happens to be exactly like the old power structure, so we can fit in again into an old power structure that's falling apart. That's exactly what we're seeing today. We're seeing the algorithm attacked. It's attacked from politics. I love right now, they probably have a civil war at Spotify New York at the moment. Why? Because Spotify paid $100 million to Joe Rogan to be a whore. So Joe Rogan sold his soul to Spotify. And as soon as Joe Rogan was published on Spotify, people discovered that the 10 most controversial episodes of the Joe Rogan podcast had been removed. Joe Rogan had sold himself to an old media company, which is what Spotify is. It's not new. And he was new and fresh. He was just real. He sold his soul to the devil for $100 million. Joe Rogan fans get really upset. So what Joe Rogan desperately does is that he goes out and interviews some really controversial woman, I don't even remember her name, who's written a book that transgender is the wrong thing and classical women are right or whatever. You know, it's just an opinion. He publishes that podcast on Spotify and Spotify's headquarters go bum, 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 bum. Why? Because Spotify have promised that they employ people to make the world better. It used to be churches that did that, not corporations. Now, where does this madness come from? The madness comes from the fact that since the internet was launched in the 1980s, we have, as a humanity, together, started hating advertising. We hate when people contact us and we haven't asked for it. We call it spam. I love ad blockers. I love spam filters. They're probably some of the most amazing innovations in mankind's history because they alleviate us from all the junk and nonsense that we do not want. Because we want the free and open algorithm. We want to get to what we're looking at when we go online. We don't want anybody to disturb that process. We want it to be free and open. 
So the advertisers in the 1980s have gone into some kind of tailspin where they first went into advertising, and later they didn't even call it advertising, they started calling it marketing. And when they couldn't call it marketing any longer, they just started calling it communication. And they tried to create some kind of a dictatorship of the communication agencies. That's basically capitalism in the 2020s. And it means that, yeah, um, we're selling a madras here in Manchester, but we're going to pretend our corporation is all about building bakeries in Burundi. That's corporations in the 2020s. It's completely devoid of reality. It's like, no, you don't build bakers in Burundi. You build madrasses in Manchester. And I live in Manchester, I want to have a fucking madras. I don't need a story told about madras. I want a madras. I want a thing, a product, best product, best price. No, but all this pretentious nonsense has been put on the top of messages from the old power structures, from corporations, from nation states, from mass media, and most of all, the worst of all is academics. I assure you, academics will die in the next 10 years. It's so ripe for tech startups right now to just kill it. It cost you $55,000 to attend Harvard this fall. $55,000 for one semester online. You can go to fucking praxis.com and get exactly the same courses with better professors, fairer testing, no quotas when it comes to student approval either, so that means you're smart if you do it, and you then test and certify you've been to praxis.com for $1,200. That's exactly how the new paradigm kills the old, just like the last time. Far lower costs. And of course, there's the corruption of money coming in the other part here. So, Google at least tried to keep the ads separate from the search. The ad was like separate. It's like old paradigm is ad. You pay to be seen. You pay for having people's eyeballs being disturbed with you. Now, why do you pay for an ad? Why do you pay for an ad in internet society? You pay for an ad because you're so fucking rubbish at what you do, so you're getting desperate about it, so you pay your way to getting attention. Everybody knows that. When you do Google search, 99% of people press the search, which is algorithmic. They don't press the ad. And Google still fancies them to believe that the ad is important to have there. That's why people pay way too much for having Google ads, because Google ads don't result in anything. Why? Because we hate ads. You know YouTube? A couple of Finnish sociologists did an interesting experiment last year. You know how on YouTube, how you get a fucking ad? You have to remove the ad, and you want to remove the ad as quickly as possible because you hate it, because you want to have Joe Rogan or whatever else instead, right? So they did a test last year, and it showed that out of a thousand times that people use YouTube, 992 out of a thousand times they press the button exactly after five seconds to go rid of the ad. Imagine you're a guy who goes to a bar here in Prague on a Friday night. You walk into the bar. And 992 out of a thousand women spit you in the face as soon as they see you. Wouldn't you just go home and hang yourself? I think corporations should. I think they're horrible. I don't want them. They prove no value at all in my life. Yes, I've created the chaos together with 7 billion other people who throw all kinds of shit out there. But if the algorithm is going to be around, it can sort that out for me. So I don't want the corruption of money. And the irony is that Google tried to keep the ads separate from the search, although they put the ads more and more in your face, because the only thing at Google that makes money for them is actually Google search still in 2020. It's ripe for takeover right now. And Google, therefore, have employed 50,000 people in Mountain View, whose job is basically to tell people how to cheat their way up the algorithm. Because they can't have the ad within the algorithm, because then they'd be corrupt. OK, that is one of the nastiest things people could do. It's called search optimization. Have you heard about that? Isn't that pure evil? Organized lying? I met with Volkswagen in Stuttgart in Germany a few years ago. I was one of those things where they bring in the philosopher to test try their things, the ideas they're up to. And um, I basically told them, why are you spending $40 million on search optimization in Europe? And Volkswagen said, well, we have to get it written the algorithm. So you spent $40 million on cheating and lying? Mm, yeah. OK, you're Germans, and you spend $40 million on cheating and lying. I thought you were better than that in Germany. Well, one of the guys raised his hand and said, well, Alexander, if you don't spend $40 million on search optimization, what are you going to spend the money on? I looked him in the eye and said, how about building a better car, stupid? They had the diesel engine scandal the year after, right? 
It's just, it's just the algorithm is merciless, and you've learned it from Bitcoin. The thing about the internet, the thing about digital, is that it's merciless at bullshitting. Merciless. It doesn't buy into the bullshit. If we look at collectively the data from tons of people who use a certain service, the way the algorithm will present it, the algorithm will give you the truth. The only concern you've got left is that how the free and open algorithm is constructed for you is interesting here. And this is where we go really into paradigmatics. And this is where I want to challenge you. Don't settle for being mediocre paradigmatically just because your neighbor is bad at it. Don't settle for the standards of the tech giants in Silicon Valley. They were doomed 10 years ago. Yeah, they would be the first wave of sort of an infantile internet, but they're not going to be the end of it at all. Bitcoin will survive all of them. Crypto will certainly survive all of them. Crypto is the biggest revolution to contract writing we've had since we invented written language. Thousands of strangers can start communicating with each other with trust because of crypto. It's fantastic. Its potential is enormous. And all of these new technologies we're developing right now are getting rid of bullshit to go towards the truth, the factual truth. It's all about reality. It's not about different stories being told. Postmodernism is over. Digital killed it. It's real. But here's the thing. A free and open algorithm will reflect you. It will reflect your friends. It will reflect your family, your clan, your tribe. It will reflect the context you created for yourself towards finding truth. If you trust a neighbor, if you trust a friend, with parents often, if they trust their kids, that will be part of your algorithm. The algorithm should really be called, you know, yesterday's magic is always tomorrow's technology. I would say the algorithm, the free and open algorithm, is like an angel. It follows you your entire life. It develops itself with you. But that also means because it reflects the existential choices you make in your life. Here's the trick. The algorithm can even put you into the underclass, full of slave mentality in the internet world. Or it can put you at the very top of things, being heroic and autocratic in the internet world. And the small difference between the two is all about whether you like to be challenged. The echo chambers are underclass phenomena. They're typical examples of what losers do when they get a panic. They isolate themselves with people who agree with them all the time. And then they become a lynch mob because the only way they can keep together and have a dialogue with each other, since they agree with everything, is by finding somebody outside of the system they can go after. This is why Hitler and the Jew, Stalin and the Kulak, Mao and the Cultural Revolution, all these things are now coming back to the West in the terms of world culture. It's all a bunch of losers who feel they have the right to take the losing mentality, the slave mentality, out on everybody else. It's the Rousseau and Lynch mobs on the back again. And the only defense we have against those, it's a word that I call antagony. Not antagonism, but antagony. To be antagonic is not to be antagonistic. To be antagonic is to look for people who challenge you at all times. Then you get out of the echo chambers quickly. And then you arrive in communities where people don't agree with you, they have different points of view, they have different stories to tell, the different backgrounds, and what happens to you? Your algorithm gets better and you get smarter. Welcome to the Neurocratic World. Thank you for having me. Alexander, thanks a lot for a very impressive presentation. And I think we have a, some free time for a few questions. So, any questions? Uh, don't hesitate. Ask. Be antagonic. Yeah. Uh, microphone. What is the free algorithm actually built up by? The, the algorithm is basically very simple. It's awareness and credibility. And you can add other factors to it. But the problem with Google, when we work at Google at the moment, is that they try to add a lot of things that are political or they get corrupted by the money. And basically, we're warning them. We said, I, th I, think, I don't think it's that expensive to build a new algorithm at all or to build search for that. In the, the way we describe it among activists like you, we're all activists in the room, is that I, I, I preach a principle that I call technological sufficiency. 
So always go for the technology that is sufficient for your needs, not necessarily the best one, because the big tech giants will certainly beat them at you know, being better. But go for the experience that is good enough for you, but that provides you with the maximum amount of freedom. The irony in all this is because it's so brutally honest, is that if you operate according to freedom as your main principle, and your technological is sufficient in everything you do, you'll be very popular with other freedom lovers. So your algorithm points you towards people who are antagonic with you, but love freedom. And I think loving freedom is the only value we need to share right now. And if you focus on loving freedom, and everything else is dependent on that, including Bitcoin, for example, then you maximize that, you maximize that in your behavior, then I would say right now to see where Twitter is heading compared to Gab or Parler or whatever, when everything you use, DuckDuckGo, it's not as good as Google Search, people use it anyway. We use ProtonMail instead of Gmail. Why? We get away from the tech giants. And this is a healthy sign of understanding that by not compromising on my freedom, as long as I get a technologically sufficient solution to what I do, I'll be ahead of the game. Scuttlebutt is perfect for this. Hard drives everywhere, no data centers, totally decentralized, and any hacker in the world who wanted to be on Facebook, the real Facebook, are now creating Scuttlebutt instead. Fantastic mechanisms. Great stuff, really innovative, created. Decentralized, bottom up. All of them. So, I mean, we don't need top-down because we have algorithms. That's the point. We don't need to look for the Messiah right now because whatever technology is delivered to us, technology is delivered to the Savior. It's called the algorithm. That's exactly why algorithms is the real war. The real war the next 30 years, the war of the algorithms. And if you look into an algorithm today coming from a big tech giant, it's already corrupted and manipulated like mad. So start by, I would propose, actually, maybe starting here, unless somebody's already done it, to have a free and open algorithm movement. And then Bitcoin, all these other stuff that we have, these technologies you cannot manipulate, will be part of that. But I think the free and open algorithm has to be fought for. It's almost a messianic cause. Yep. So, um, within the impressive framework of uh, information transformation, um, I wonder what would be the in your opinion, the interesting applications of crypto, because we are in a crypto place currently. Which, Anything which you think, this is, this is all about time. Space is gone. Everything in the world today because of digital travels within a microsecond across the world. You might have a problem playing a computer game if you're stuck in New Zealand playing with somebody from Svalbard, but that's very minor, right? And that's because you're good. But other than that, actually, everything travels so fast, the space is gone. This is all about time. It's all about the time constraints. It's all about the time axis. So everything from now on will, by us, naturally be valued according to how much time does it consume for us. That's if we want to get rid of anything in the way, ad blockers, spam filters, everything that disturbs us. So you want to have a clean, pure communication. So then I would say the crypto, what crypto comes in is that when you have a need to lock in something along the time axis and said, this undeniably happened here. Okay. You can't change that. Then you're going to kill the nation states. You're going to kill corporations that we know them. You're going to kill anything from the old paradigm. You're going to kill anything that looks the slightest bit legal or judicial because you're going to have a mechanism where we always know that with the contract. It's always the last paragraph in the contract is the only thing that's important. I know it from the music industry. It's only the last paragraph. And the last paragraph says, in case there is a conflict between these two parties, this is where they go, here's the arbiter. And if the arbiter cannot be removed or changed and is fixed, that means you can lock history in forever. It's almost like a Platonist fantasy, but it's all about the path. You can lock history in forever and cannot change it. So that also means if you are private about something or you do something you don't want your wife to know, don't use crypto with it <laughs> because it will be locked in forever in time. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of our time. Maybe very last, very fast question and fast answer. Yeah, if, okay, if you can. I think I got my answer, so I will pass yeah. it on. Okay. Okay, it may not be so fast, uh, but could you comment about uh, forgiveness in the digital age with the permanent record and uh, everything we do online will be saved forever and so on? Thank you. <laughs> that's what we're doing with theology next. Um, yeah, that's part of what woke culture has exposed, is that anything you've done in the past will be held against you. Uh, now, if we do that with every human being on the planet, we don't get a second chance. 
And that's the brilliance of entrepreneurship, is you get second, you get third chances. That's when we go to the world of theology. Religion taught us a lot of things. It domesticated us, it kept us in our place, it gave us the constraints so we could be creative. That's why religion is interesting to go back to. It's a theological question. If we don't implement, generously implement, forgiveness in these processes, there's no way any one of us will take any risks. And what I hold against corporations today, when I talk to the corporations, is that I said, you are supposed to be risk takers. You cannot be entrepreneurial without being a risk taker. You cannot run a company or corporation without being a risk taker. That's fundamentally for doing business at all. But since all the systems now are all about avoiding risk, like, don't ever say anything that could offend anybody. Right? If, you, if you're never going to say anything that could offend anybody, I can guarantee you that your message will not be read by anybody because it'd be so fucking boring that nobody wants to read it. It'd be dead without libido, mortidinal. And I think right now we're moving into a very sort of drastic mortidinal stage where people are totally scared and terrified of the things they got around them because they're understanding according to the old paradigm, which is that somebody will write about you in the newspaper if you do the wrong thing. But that nobody reads the newspaper any longer anyway. So you need to actually create subcultures of people who say, we're the fucking misfits, we made 50 mistakes, we touched women in the wrong place, we were hanged out during Me Too, actually we didn't die, but we almost died. Now we're around anyway, what are you gonna do with us? And we're a whole fucking subcultural people who are misfits and we call it the culture of forgiveness. I think those things are gonna come next. We need them desperately the next 10 years because otherwise we're not gonna go back to risk taking and none of you guys are gonna succeed at anything you do unless you start taking risks, including talking to people you disapprove with. Okay, Alexander, thanks a lot for a comprehensive answer. Thank you so much.